Hello and welcome back to Identity Architects, the podcast that's designed to spotlight pioneers in our industry who are changing the way that data is used to drive more engaging data-driven experiences. I'm your host, Ben Cicchetti, and for this episode, our SVP of Sales for Europe, Stuart Coleman, sat down with Matthew Roche, CEO and co-founder of ID5, to discuss the cookie-less future, the value exchange, consumer awareness of how free the internet really is, and much, much more. Before I hand it over to Stu and Matthew, just a reminder to hit that subscribe button so you know when the latest episodes of Identity Architects land. But without any further delay, here's Stu's conversation with Matthew. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Identity Architects. Um, I'm really pleased today to welcome Matthew from uh, ID5. He is the co-founder and uh, CEO of ID5. Um, I actually first met Matthew at, uh, in his ID5 guys um, at a coffee shop in uh, kind of northeast London about five, six years ago. I don't know if you remember, Matthew. Um, and the thing the very really, early days. It was the very Absolutely. early days. And the thing that really struck me then uh, that I'm really looking forward to kind of getting into today was your your clear vision, your passion, and your determination for what you wanted to do. It's very, it came across very clearly that that this is something you really believed in, you were going to make it happen. So, I'm, a, I'm really pleased that we're able to sit here today and talk about uh, kind of your time in the industry and the success you've seen with ID5. But, but b, uh, it's great to see that passion and that kind of. Uh, um, uh, kind of focus really kind of come to light. So look, really looking forward to kind of getting I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you call it passion and, and clear vision. Some people would call it craziness. My wife probably <laughs> would call it craziness. <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm really looking forward to getting to that and really appreciate your time today. It's, um, it really is great to speak to you. Thanks for having me. Um, I will let you uh, uh, kind of give a quick introduction to yourself in a minute. Um, just for, for listeners, standard format for, for our Identity Architects podcast. Um, I'm going to give Matthew a, a few kind of quick hard questions, just dive into a little bit about kind of his time and, and uh, history and advertising, things that, that interest and excite him. We're then going to dive a bit deeper into some kind of more meaty questions about the industry today, where, we're, where we are with identity and some of the challenges we face and the opportunities that come from those. But I'm going to uh, stop talking for a moment and let Matthew kind of give you a, a bit of an introduction to him if that's okay yes absolutely uh well so thanks again for for inviting me so i am as you said the co-founder and ceo of id5 um i'm originally french but been living in london for 12 years now actually about to become a british citizen next month wow. uh, fingers have you, crossed have you passed the test I'm, I'm i have passed all the tests wow. i haven't learned uh, god save the king yet <laughs> but uh but uh that's on my to-do list for for the weekend brilliant um, and yeah, I lived in London uh, with my wife and three daughters for, for 12 years now. Uh, and uh, uh, I've uh, you know, spent most of my career in, uh, in uh, digital advertising, started in the early 2000s in, in the data space. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, fast forward 15 years later in 2017, decided to, uh, uh, out of passion or craziness, uh, depending on, 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 on which both. side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> or both, or both, probably both. Uh, decided to launch ID5, and uh, yeah, uh, five six years later, there we are. Um, yeah. That's that's uh, that's uh, that's that's the story. Brilliant. Well, so we're looking forward to getting into that as we go through. But let's start with the quick fire questions, um, and this really just to um, uh, be honest with us. That's that's the best way to answer these. Um, so uh, let's start with what's your kind of first or earliest memory in advertising? Um, it's it's really one of creativity. I think it's the ads that we used to see on the telly, right? Um, and uh, when when I was a kid, which was like you know late seventies, early eighties, um, uh, those those it was really the heyday of creativity. I think. And one ad that really strikes me, I don't know if you had it in the UK, it was a, an ad for uh, sparkling water Perrier, yep. uh, with a, with a woman and a lion who were kind of climbing up a mountain and battling at the top of the mountain for dominance over the Perrier bottle, right? Which is like you know, just a random ad, but like it's it's the uh, uh, and, and full disclosure, I got the quick fire question beforehand, so I had the time to think about this. <laughs> it's, it's the image that, that, that got to me first. Yep. It's this, this ad for Perrier. So really about creativity, really about kind of, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the impact it, it, it had. And, and, uh, uh, now I think if you tell me about like what, what I think about advertising, where I think it's important, I think about it more, much more as a business model. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, when I was a kid, it was really this creativity angle. Absolutely, and so many people um, cite uh, kind of nineteen eighties TV ads as, as as what kind of uh, ignited their interest in or, or, or uh, passion for, for. Not sure if you can have a passion for advertising, but um, you know, it was. It, you're right. It was such a creative period. It was such a period of storytelling and and um, 
you know kind of engagement and I, I I'm, I'm with you I think it was a real kind of heyday of 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 advertising creativity within advertising I think I mean you know I, I think everything uh, the older you get the the, the 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 better the better the past sounds right uh, I think I, I think there are still a lot of creativity in the industry maybe different forms maybe not the the traditional 30 second TV spot but like you know, there's there's all there's all sort of very creative ways for brands to engage with their customers. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of like the you know the the childhood memories uh, that that I think we grew up in a, in, a, in an exciting time from an advertising standpoint because yep. it was a lot of new stuff. Yeah. It was also probably a bit more um, um, controversial. You were allowed to be a bit more controversial than you are today, right? Yeah. Um, as a brand, especially, it was less politically correct and everything. So. I think that made the whole the whole space very exciting, very interesting. It made us who we are. Exactly, <laughs> defined us. Brilliant. So, so you created this, or you 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 kind of found this this interest in or, or love for advertising through TV. What was your first job when you kind of entered advertising? Uh, I kind of entered in in uh, almost by by mistake, um, not by mistake, but like I. Uh, so I started my career in a in a in, a, in consulting um, out of uh, you know right after, uh, out of university, and then. Um, Lasted all of six months in that consulting firm. <laughs> not and, not uh, as creative as you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was really because so I was I, I studied in the US and uh, late nineties. It was all about the internet revolution. Yep. Got back to uh, Europe to France for uh, my first consulting job, and and the the big theme was like, well, is this thing even for real? Right? Is the internet even a real thing? Like, well, what should we do about it? It's so a lot of typical French, also probably uh, kind of a you know second guessing and like. Yeah, pessimism and everything it was like guys like i just i just lived it like i i saw this it for real like this is real yep um and uh and so i jumped ship and went into a, a kind of a small uh, investment firm how do you say the investment firm that invested in internet startups yep and one of the first company we invested in at the time was a company called webrama which was doing uh, audience measurement uh, for mostly for advertising which was doing kind of audience profiling so the early days of behavioral advertising um, and uh, and when we had a chance to invest in that company, and then later on, kind of uh, uh, acquire the whole the whole company and kind of you know uh, uh, build build and uh, uh, yeah that that business to I think it's about like 200, 250 people right now. It's still running actually. Yep. Um, I that's that's how I ended up kind of joining the company as a in a, in an operational role. Uh, so that was my way into advertising. It was almost by you know through kind of a, a diversion in a way. By being uh, by being an investor and then and then a part of part owner of the of the business with that fund. Yep, and you've obviously um, you've got a stellar career and and um, a great kind of portfolio of things that you've achieved that you can you can now look back on and go this is great and this is great. But if you went back to that time when when you kind of found yourself in advertising, um, knowing the things you know now, what would you say to yourself back then? What kind of advice would you give to yourself? S- start a company sooner. <laughs> I, just, okay. I started at 40, right? Uh, uh, ID5 is my first company, probably going to be my last. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, um, but doing that at 40, when you've got a mortgage and kids go to school and like everything, like, you know, a, a lifestyle and stuff, it's much more difficult yep. than when you're 25. Yep. And so if I was to adv- give myself an advice, back the, you know, the younger, my, the, the younger self, my younger self back when I was 25 and started in, in this industry, I was like, just, just give it a try straight away, yep. right? Don't wait. It's so much more exciting. It's, it's so much more. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a serial entrepreneur, but, uh, but I've really found, you know, being in, being in control of, of, you know, you're never entirely in control, but like being able to take your decision, you know, uh, to take your own decision, to, to kind of follow your instincts, to, uh, you know, work with the people you want to work with. To decide right what, what your professional life is going to look like, again to some extent because you know the bigger you get the more you have to take into account kind of stakeholders and yep. investors and yep. clients and everything but like still you're you're still very much in control. Um, I think that's something I realize now I would have enjoyed a lot more when I was 25 and I was a lot less to lose. Uh, uh, so that would probably be my uh, my uh, my advice to myself. That and buy Bitcoin when it was a. Uh, a dollar and, and definitely buy bitcoin <laughs> yeah yeah you know, a, friend, a, good, a good friend of mine was early on bitcoin yep he's, he's bought himself a really really nice car just with the uh, <laughs> just with the profits Brilliant. really nice one yeah uh, that's uh, another story for yeah. another day but... I mean, hi, if you're listening if you're listening hi i i want to ride in that uh, in that r8 of yours <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. um and uh, I, I mentioned when i first met you 
uh, in the ID5 guys, I, I mentioned your passion. It's clear that you do have a, a passion for the industry that we're in. So what is it about the industry that you love? Um, what is it that, that kind of creates that kind of passion for you today? As I said earlier, I think it's, I, I really look at it now as a business model and, and it's a very, I think it's a really good business model because it's very equalitarian, right? Yep. Advertising pays for content and services, right? Good ads, bad ads, right? Very creative ones, boring ones, retargeting ads, all of that. It's just a means to make sure that everybody, whether you're rich or poor, whether you live in, in the UK or in, or in, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a less, uh, less kind of wealthy or less democratic country, you can have access to information. You can have access to content and services that make your life better. Yep. Um, and, and I think that's a great business model. Yeah. Right. There's not a lot of those of those ways to make this to make society better at, at, a, at a great scale. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, drawbacks, right, uh, to to that business model as well. But like fundamentally, it's it's just a, a better way to pay for stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, and and I think uh, uh, when when you think about the importance of communication, of of free press, of uh, you know independent journalism, you know the uh, uh, quality points of views, like that's all paid for by advertising. Yeah. Right. The reason why we have a, a great newsroom, whether you agree with the Daily Mail or News UK or Fox News or all those things, it's it's irrelevant. It's the fact that they exist that's important, right? And the fact that we have different points of views that are just not not just kind of anonymous people shouting in the public square. Which is what Twitter and, and social media is like, but that have like that have a, a journalism ethic, that have a responsibility, that are signing with their own name, and, and that have a brand that can stand for what they say. Like yeah. that's you know, advertising has a big a big responsibility in supporting all of that. It, it right? does, and I wonder whether we've we've um, lost that view a little bit. Whether people really understand that today? Yeah, they take it for granted. Like the internet is free. Yeah. Well, not really. It's, it's definitely not really. Not there's a bunch of servers, there's a bunch of engineers, there's a bunch of content creators, journalists, designers. There's a lot of people working mm -hmm. to make the internet what it is. And it's not free. Those people have salaries and, and, and their salaries is by and large paid for by advertising. Yep. Yep. That's, that's the balance that we found. And I think that balance is really, really important because if you consider the alternative, you know, it's, it's either subscription based, so only the rich get access to content and services that, are, that is qualitative or it is it is a, a fake news and and a news that is published with an intent yep. with a narrative with an intent to push a certain point of view but without actually saying it right because not, not you know if, if you think about like sponsored content they don't have journalistic responsibility journalistic ethos they don't have like all of those kind of characteristics and and that's yeah there's nothing that 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 prevents this type of content from being fraudulent or from being, uh, from being uh, 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 you know, just like plain, plain false, right? Yeah. Amen. So the alternative isn't great. Amen the, to that, definitely. You know? yeah, so I, I think that's, that's what I'm really passionate about is yeah. how do we make sure we can maintain that balance? We can maintain, you know, the ability for the wider population, not just the rich, uh, but the wider population to have access to content. Sorry, I mean, God knows we've seen, you know, in, in the political landscape of the past few years that, that fake news and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, 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 bad influences can have a dramatic impact on people's life. I mean, we live in the UK, which is not part of the European Union anymore. And and, okay. uh, and, <laughs> let's, and let's not get and, political. But I get, I I I know you enough to know that I think you agree with me on that topic. Uh, and and uh, and and it's uh, you know, it's it, we need we need uh, we need ways for people to be educated, right? Because what what has led by and large to that decision is false narratives, false content, promises that were never kept, right? And and if people are educated, if people have different points of view that they can compare, right? And that's what that's what journalism is about. And I think, you know, having having the ability to support that is a is a is a good mission. It's not just about selling more soap or shampoos or, you know, or or bottles of sparkling waters. It's about making sure we can by doing that in a way, but like making sure we can support this uh, this uh, this great mechanism of sharing content and information, uh, quality content and information, right? If by doing that, we can also avoid some of the more kind of antagonizing and, and, uh, and, uh, uh yeah, uh, dangerous, harmful impacts. Great. Yep. Uh, but we have to, you know, we, we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater, right? There is, there is a lot of good in this. So when you're, uh, 
when your British citizenship comes through. I'm voting for you for PM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my next venture, of course. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, a um, couple more quick fire questions for you. So um, we're going to talk a lot about identity. Um, it's a really um, key subject and it is the theme of this podcast, hence why we're talking about it. But um, as an industry, we're kind of obsessed a little bit with this kind of concept of identity. Um, how would you explain in a kind of a advertising digital sense, how would you explain identity to a 10 year old? Yeah, I, I had to do that because my daughters are now 15 and 16. So they were really, they were 10 when I started ID5. Um, and so at first I told them I was working with cookies, which I totally understood. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted, they wanted me to bring them, bring them some back home. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, but then I, I, I really focused on, on the, uh, on the notion of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of targeting and measurement, right? The notion of, it's not about knowing who you are. It's about knowing what you're interested in and, and be able to recognize uh, 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 kind of what you've done to understand how that, you know, that, that, it, that interaction has impacted your behavior, right? right. Which, is, which is what advertising is about, right? And so I think if you, if you, and we're using the term identity, which is a bit misleading. It's really about recognizing devices uh, uh, rather than really identifying people. But anyway, um, uh, it's, it's, yeah. So, so again, when I had to explain that to my daughters five, six years ago, and, and, uh, once I had to go beyond the fact that cookies were really cool, <laughs> <laughs> which is what they thought, um, it was really about, well, you know, if, if people are going to pay money to, to, uh, to, to, to run advertising, they need to know if it works. Yep. Right. Yep. And so that's about, that's about measuring the, 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 the effectiveness of, you know, and, and knowing that. When you've seen an ad, you've gone into into the the store and and bought something from the store. That's what the store is interested in. And and ties back to what we said about um, you know, the internet isn't free. It's understanding where the value is created and the, the yeah. need to to understand how that value is created through measurement. And I think and, and in identity, we talk a lot about about targeting. I think the actual the actual uh, uh, the, the real thing we have to solve for is measurement. Yeah. More so than targeting, right? Targeting is important, but there's there's alternatives to targeting. You can yeah. you can do a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways you can make sure that your message reaches the right audience. Yeah. Um, um, however, being able to measure is really what, and it's also it's also what drives. Like if you measure, uh, you um, you in a way you influence the money flow, right? Yep. Google's greatest acquisition isn't DoubleClick; it's Virgin. The, the you know the what became Google Analytics. Yep. Because all of a sudden they had the tools to know to measure and to help people decide what worked. Yep. If we can make measurement work without being dependent on cookies and, and mates and stuff like that, then we're going to really rebalance the money flow to the places where people spend most of most of the time, which is not just Google and Facebook, but it's also a lot of the premium publishers and a lot of content producers and service yep. producers out there. Yeah. So yeah. Actually, no, that, that, that <laughs> makes, makes a lot of sense. And there's so many, you say about targeting, there are so many targeting options that don't have to be based on an individual uh, on yeah. identity. But yeah, the, the measurement on the back end of it, just, it, it, you know, it's the old saying, you know, uh, I know 50% of my advertising works, I just don't know which 50%. We have the tools and the mechanisms yeah. now to know which 50% works. And, yeah. and, and you're absolutely right, that's where we should invest. We're going to talk a bit, a bit more about that when we get into the, the, kind of the, the meteor questions. Uh, a couple of last questions for you. Um, uh, one first question: What keeps you awake at night? What do you worry about? Right now, frankly, nothing. I sleep like a stone because I'm so tired. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But nothing can keep me awake at night. What motivates you in the morning? What What makes you want to get up and and, and yeah? Uh, so the reason why I'm so tired is because I get up at six in the morning or six thirty in the morning and go to the gym. Okay. And that's really my that's really what drives my day. Like in the day, I don't go every day, but like I try to go three or four times a week. I yep. started doing that about what fifteen months ago, maybe, um, because I realized that my brain doesn't work if my body doesn't. Yep. And and uh, and when you spend a lot of time uh, uh, working rather than exercising, there's an imbalance that creates. Yeah, absolutely. That's created. And so I started going to the gym a lot more. So that really drives my day. Okay. And I'm so energized, slightly t more tired, but so energized when I come back from the gym in the morning. Yep. Uh, that and like three or four espressos. Um, <laughs> it's like gets me started. I've actually, because I do the gym as well now, I think it's an age thing. You realize that you've got to look I think it's the life crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, I found these caffeine chews that you can have, which is essentially like three three espressos, but in a toffee chew that you can have. And I have one of those before I go to the gym. Oh, next time I see you, I'll bring you one. Okay. I actually like the coffee. It's not so much the caffeine. And I can have one at like one in the morning. I'll still get asleep like a stone 10 minutes later. So it doesn't really. You know, it's just, uh, I, yeah, 
big coffee person. Yeah. And then uh, final quick fire question. If there was a song that was the soundtrack of your life, what would it be? The tricky question. So there's, so we, we, we made, uh, we made ID5 t-shirts a few years ago. Uh, one of my co-founders, Scott is, is uh, well known for his, uh, um, Dis disputable tastes when it comes to t shirt right? His favorite, his favorite, uh, is my, my favorite t shirt of his is, uh, is a t shirt that said, search hard, search hard, display harder, which is a, which is a private ad tech joke that I love. Yep. But he made one with don't stop believing with written in HTML. So, uh, you know, like, uh, uh yeah. So don't stop believing could have been one. Uh, but in reality, when I thought about this question, I, 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 thought about, and again, I'm going to show my age here. So it's, uh, you know, this early 2000, I feel maybe mid 2000 artist called Dido. Yep. No, Dido. Uh, beautiful voice. Yep. Uh, and she had a song called Thank You. Yep. Uh, and that's the first one that came to mind. Um, I thought like, I've been very lucky. Um, you know, my, my, my family's amazing, uh, very supportive. My wife's been super supportive in the whole ID5 adventure, despite considering that I'm totally crazy. Um, I've got a great team, uh, ID5 is, you know, is going well, um, like, you know, frankly, I'm just thankful. Yeah. I yeah. think if you look back at like the past, well, it's, that can be 47 years soon. Um, that's, that's the, the best summary I can, uh, I can find. Brilliant. Well, it's, it, it's a lovely song to have as a soundtrack of your life. And I'm very glad you didn't say it was Dido's song with Eminem, which was called Stan, <laughs> because then I would have been very confused. <laughs> Good. Right. Let's get into, into the meat of some of the things that are going on. Let, and let's level set first with, um, uh, first question, which is we, we, we kind of talk a lot about the demise of third party cookies and cookie apocalypse and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's almost become a bit of a, um, a running joke in the industry about whether it's happening or not, etc. I, yeah. I guess it doesn't. It doesn't the really. Year matter. The year of the mobile. Yeah, it, it, well, the year of the mobile. Yeah, we we lived that for a decade, didn't we? Um, but I, but I think we can all agree that uh, a future uh, where cookies aren't as important as they were in terms of third party sense, other ways in which which you can understand and engage audiences makes a lot of sense. What's your thoughts on? Um, kind of the status quo of where we are right now as an industry. Where, you know, let's level set on, yeah, on, on where we're at. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's the future. I think it's the present. I think they're already gone. Like, it doesn't matter when, when Google kills them, they're already dead. Yep. Like, we already live in a cookie-less present, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're a publisher, 30 to 40% of your traffic cannot be monetized. Or like, is monetized at like 70% discount from, from, uh, from what it's worth on Chrome because there are no cookies. Uh, when you're a brand, you can't really engage with 30 or 40% of your client base, of your audience, of your prospects. So like, it's not just marginal, it's already there. It's already significant. It's a significant uh, 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 part of the world that is invisible. So we're already in a cookie less present. Yep. And, and I think as, as an industry, we've kind of kept that hidden under the rug. It's like, you know, the dirty little secret that nobody talks about because frankly, when you're paid on a on a percentage of media spend, where the media where the media money goes doesn't really matter. You're still getting your ten percent or your twenty percent or your fifty percent if you're Google. So so it doesn't matter. And and as a result, there's a very very little incentive for the in, intermediaries to drive that money to a better a, a broader set of the audience. Yep. Right. Yep. So I think we need more pressure from publishers who have been suffering from sub-optimal monetization on all of this invisible part of the world. Yep. And we need more pressure from brands who have been in, 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 uh, uh, unable to uh, address a big part of their target customers, right? If we have those two kind of end of the market pressure, the middleman, which understandably isn't necessarily, you know, uh, 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 incentivized to do a lot of effort because at the end of the day, if the media budget doesn't grow, their 10% doesn't grow, and so, you know, why should they invest more in making things better? So yeah. I kind of understand where we are. I think we're in a bit of this, this kind of uh, um, um, deadlock right now where the interest on, on both ends is going, but it's really a technical thing. Yep. And the people with the technical answer are the technology companies, yep. right? So it's, it's, it's down to us to make it happen. But there is little kind of common incentive just because of the business model that we're working with doesn't incentivize us to reach kind of a, a, a larger part of the population. So I think, I think that's where we are. And I think it's getting better. I think, you know, we started, we started in 2017. So cookie less wasn't even a word then, <laughs> um, um, but, um, but, uh, you know, having kind of been, been, you know, banging that drum for yep. the past seven years, six years is like, I think 
us and others, right? It's 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 becoming more of a common topic that we're missing out on a big part of the world. Um, and and uh, uh, yeah, so so we're getting there. It's um it's a fundamental transformation. I mean, we're, we're changing the engine in mid-flight, right? Like it's yep. literally we're we're rebuilding the house. Yep. We're, we're replacing the foundation with without kind of uh, uh, allowing the house to crumble, right? That, changing that's... changing the wheels on a moving car. Yes. Oh yeah, that's even more challenging actually, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's that's the type of that's the type of, of challenge we're up against, right? It's, we have to make that transition happen without, uh, 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 well, the luxury of like stopping everything for a year yeah. and rebuilding it from scratch on a new foundation, right? Because yeah, yeah. that doesn't work, right? So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a really really complex challenge, and you need everybody's incentive to be aligned. I don't think they are still. So we need to make those incentives kind of clearer. And we need to put more pressure because there's no question of if there's there's a question of when, uh, and the sooner the better because it's already a massive pain for a lot of brands and a lot of publishers. Yeah, I'd, I'd also uh, I've said this a few times to to a few people when actually on on one of these before. The other thing, cookies. I think um, the challenge we we have with third party cookies is it made us lazy. No, it, it was the no, it was this kind of the Swiss easy. Army knife. Of, uh, yeah, it's easy. It, yeah. it was just easy to do anything. Whatever you want to do, it didn't matter whether it was good yeah. or bad. It was just easy to do. Yeah. So I think we're not only we're we fighting a technological change as part of this, but we're also fighting a, a yeah, or a you know, we're, we're just so used to doing it this way. It was just so easy. What do you mean I have to do more work, or it's not as easy as it was or, or was? Or there's a yeah. challenge with this. So, so I think there's a there's a psychological or, or, or philosophical change as part of that as well, as well as and, it, and it also what makes it difficult is that it's very technical. Mm. Right? It's very very technical. It's very deep into the the architecture of the industry. It's really a a, a, a foundational layer that yep. we have to change. Yep. Which which not a lot of people truly understand how it works. We we started we looked a lot of, a lot at uh, at cookie matching early in in the early days, right? Around the notion of match rates, around the notion of uh, permissioning uh, cookie matching based on consent, um, uh, you know, optimizing uh, yeah uh, match tables distribution to so yep. the, the 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 very very small number of people who actually understand and I'm talking big ad tech companies, right? Yep. Like. Listen, this thing was written by the predecessor of my predecessor in, in the architecture engineering team back in 2007. Yep. Like, I don't know how it's built. I don't know how our, tech, our pixel fire. I don't know what they do. I don't know why they do this. Like, we, we've lost a lot of that because it's kind of, again, the foundation, right? It's the, uh, it's the bricklayers. They came in first, they did their job, and then they're gone. And yeah. like, nobody else knows how they did it. Absolutely. Yeah, that 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 technical. Uh, so that makes knowledge. it that makes it a, a much more difficult topic to address, right? It's yeah. not something that is visible and easy to understand either, right? There's so much confusion. People talk about third-party cookies, third-party data. Like, is it the same thing? No, it's different, yeah. right? And and what are cookies used for? It's not just targeting. It's measurement. It's frequency capping, and 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 like it's yeah, it's so so confusing because it's very technical. Yeah. So. Um, where does the responsibility for change sit? So we, we talked a little bit about Google and, and others about how it became just easy for them to, to, to manage and control and, and influence where the money went. We talked a little bit about publishers and, and brands needing to step up. But where does that responsibility for, for driving change in how we approach this and what we do and how we create better outcomes? Wh whose responsibility is that? I think it's a collective responsibility. You need leaders. I think ID5 is one of the leaders in that space, driving that change. Um, but but it's everybody's responsibility to to uh, to educate, understand, and and do something about it. And and, and on that, um, identity is going to be an integral part of the future. I mean, your yeah. your your business is built on that, so you you're going to agree with me on that. And I, and I think it's I a do good agree thing. with that. Um, <laughs> If you're sat in front of a brand or advertiser, we talked about them being the ones that really had to step up and start to help drive this change and this evolution. Um, what what kind of recommend what kind of advice or recommendations would you be giving them right now in terms of their, their kind of short mid term uh, future? What kind of things should they be thinking? I, about? I, I, st I still there still is there's uh, uh, you know for the majority of them there still is an element of education, right? What exactly are we talking about? What is at stake here? What are you what are you losing out? Uh, by by not kind of taking this topic seriously, yep. uh, so I think that's number one, right? Understand your dependencies, understand what you what you cannot monetize as a publisher, understand what you cannot reach as a brand. Um, there, so it's yeah, it's kind of uh, um, understanding, and and then testing because by testing you're putting your money where your mouth is, and money is what's going to drive change, right? The more people embrace 
cookie-less addressability and measurability solutions, the more those solutions will get traction, they will get adoption, and the more they will become a viable alternative, a viable replacement infrastructure for the industry to work with. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, yeah, so it's kind of my, my, my piece of advice is understand what, what's happening and what's at stake, you yeah. know, to some level. You don't need to become a, an expert in the technical mechanisms of, of the entity protocol, but like understand what's at stake and how it works. And, and, and put your money where your mouth is. Once you understand it's critical for your success as a business today and tomorrow, put your money where your mouth is, invest, spend time, and, and, and drive. Like, change isn't going to happen by magic. If you sit on the sidelines, you don't have a, you don't have a say. Yep. And, and, and if you want to have a say, if you want to participate, if you want to, if you want to shape the future that actually works for you, get in there, right? The, the money where your mouth bit, bit I think I think is uh, is interesting. I, I think publishers, uh, and I'm picking on publishers because uh, they're probably further advanced on this than, than the brands right now. But they are um, naturally quite risk averse, um, and maybe may, maybe part of the challenge um, is knowing which way to go, which 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 technologies to invest in, which which um, kind of partners to back. Maybe there's a an element of that. Maybe we need to increase the, the level of, of risk we're willing to take to help. Yeah, you know what? I sometimes often often we get well not so much more now, but like in the early days, we got a lot of people saying like, well, I, I don't know which one I should work with, so I'm not gonna work with anyone and I'll let the market decide. <laughs> Dude, you're the market. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. You, you decide. You decide. You do the betting and then there really people you like and people you don't like. <laughs> Use the one you like. Yeah. Don't wait for everybody else to pick the people you don't like because then next thing you know, you're screwed. Yeah. So like you're the market. We are the market. We collectively have a role in influencing. Like if you just sit on the side and wait for the market to decide, the market doesn't doesn't there's not an organization. The market isn't someone who's gonna come in and tell you, hey guys, you should do that. Yep. No, we are the market. Yep. And to start so on that, you, you also said you know it's it's um it's a collective responsibility to kind of make this change. Um you know, I, I hope that there is, and I'd like to see more of the, the willingness for every party, you know, brands brands to want to engage more with different ways of working, publishers to be less risk averse on trying new things, and technology companies in the middle will be to be more flexible about the way in which they engage with these partners and offer the, the ability to kind of test and trial and learn. You know, I, I, we're probably quite far on that journey already, but but I, you know, I, I agree with you. It takes this kind of collective approach to, to kind of how which, we make which, the change. Which is what makes it more difficult, but it's a, it's a, it's why I'm, I'm talking about an infrastructure of a foundation, right? It's not something, identity isn't something that works on, on, on one side only, right? It's a, an identifier is, is, a, is a means to recognize the device, but it's also a currency. And the currency, by definition, has to be used by more than one party. Otherwise, you can't just trade with anyone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The currencies that are successful are the ones that are vastly adopted. Right? Most financial transactions on financial markets happen in dollars, in yen, and in euro, because they're adopted by everybody. Yeah. Right? You can trade. You can trade with everyone on the planet if you're if you're supporting trade in one of those three currencies. Yeah. Um, and and so that's why it's a collective adoption thing. It's a collective process because one person being cookieless doesn't mean anything. No. Right. We're, we're, in a, we're in a connected world. You've got buyers and sellers, and they have to work together. And that's what makes that, that, that challenge, like, the, you know, the, the, the proverbial chicken and egg, right? Like, <laughs> yep. uh, that's, that's, that's what, you know, starting at E5, it, we spend a lot of time trying to understand how to get, where, where should we start, chicken yep. or egg, right? Yep. Now we have a lot of eggs and we have more and more chicken, so we're doing good. But, like, the early days are difficult for that reason because it's a collective effort. Yeah, the answer is both. <laughs> Both, exactly. That's, that's the challenge. So the other side of this coin is the consumers. Um, and I know yeah. I've spoken to you before about kind of privacy and, and consumer choice. Uh, and again, I know it's something that you have uh, strong views on and, and passion around. Um, as the industry evolves, and we do move away from a third party cookie in that kind of tried and tested way, whether it's right or wrong about how we manage uh, consumer choice. Um, what are some of the challenges you see with some of the new ways of working that we're yet to solve or yet to find solutions for when it comes to consumer privacy, consumer choice? Yeah, so I think, I mean, first, um, we're, 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 we're not doing ourselves a service by calling it privacy. I think we have to talk about data protection, right? Because okay. yep. the notion that, that, that people are anonymous, um, First, I don't think it's good. You can see what happens when when you know people post anonymous comment on, on social media. But mostly, it's it's not what advertising needs, right? To function, advertising not need not to know that you know you're Stuart Goldman and you live there and you do that, but like to know that your computer 
is always the same computer. And when you go to this site, they can recognize you because that's how you can measure and that's how you can, you can engage with audiences at, at, in, in an efficient manner, right? Yep. Inefficient advertising is spam. Spam is worse, a lot less than, than quality advertising. And so just for that business model balance to work, we would need a lot more bad ads to pay for the same quality of content and services. So spam is not a good idea. Quality content and quality advertising is a better idea because it's, it's, it's more efficient, financially efficient, right? So we need quality advertising. So we need measurability and we need addressability, right? If you're with me on this, then it means that, 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 uh, um, um, understanding customers is important, yep. right? It's not, it's not about them being, if, if you want to be totally anonymous, fine, but then you have to pay another way because your attention as a consumer isn't monetizable if you're anonymous, right? So you can't be, you can't be totally kind of anonymous is not like unrecognizable, yep. right? It doesn't work, right? So if, if, if this is uh, uh, what you want and then there'll be like two, three, four, five percent of the population that wants to be unrecognizable, fine. We need to have micropayment services. We need to have subscription mm -hmm. services so that they can pay with their money rather than with their attention. But the other 99% of the population, they're very happy to pay with their attention. We just need to be transparent about what we're going to do and we need to do the right things, right? Recognizing a computer so that you can serve them an ad and you can measure if they've been to a site after that, after seeing that ad and everything, isn't a, a massive violation of your privacy, right? Most people who've been using cookies haven't been massively invading people's privacy. What people are, are afraid of is, are you going to steal my credit card number? Are you going to show up at my door? Are you going to pose a threat to my security by, by following me in the streets, right? Yep. They're very happy with the trade-off that says, hey, listen, ads are going to pay so that you can go check the sports course for free. That trade-off is great, as long as nothing spooky happens on the back end, right? Yeah. And, and frankly, for 99% of the cases, 99% of the people who work in this industry, nothing spooky happens, right? It's, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the bad actors that we need to rule out. And so that's where having higher bars when it comes to the framework we're using to uh, uh, share uh, information with customers, let them understand what happens, give them a choice, yes or no, no, there's, there's no free lunch, right? So if you say no, then you have to pay in another way, fine. You can totally say no, but you have to pay in another way, right? Um, but so, so, so doing better at explaining, at, at engaging with them, 99% won't care. They'll be very happy with the trade-off that we're offering them with the value proposition that, that we, you know, publishers, advertisers, technology vendors offer them. Yep. So we need to do better there. And then we need to raise the bar so that all of the bad actors, right, that are that are abusing people's data, that are abusing that, that are, I heard I heard uh, the term consentless in the context Excuse of the me? discussion. Consentless. Yes. Yes. <laughs> consentless. That's a new like, one on me. This, this is like I'm falling from my chair when I hear that. <laughs> consentless is not an option. No, no. On the contrary, we should do more to get people to understand and to agree. To being to being advertised to in an addressable and a measurable manner because it's just better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I, I think like the customer, the the person, the people are in the middle of this industry. Right. We have to. They're not on the Luma scale, but they should be. They they should be the, the middle bit of that Luma scale. Right. Yeah. We have to work around them, and so we have to include them in the discussion for those who want to be included. We have to give them a choice. And then once we're doing that, we have to raise the bar of bad practices. We have to encrypt the consent string that we're sharing better so that it cannot be spooked. We have to, um, um, uh, you know, remove some of the, 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 the side options of, uh, you know, things like legitimate interest and things like that, that are not good enough in terms of, right. We have to, we have to properly rule out people who do uh, uh, bid listening and, and, and who steal data from publishers to then re-engage with those customers elsewhere. Yep. All of those things, we can get better at doing them. Yep. Right. We, there, there are there are a lot of things we can do better, uh, and if we raise the bar, we're gonna we're gonna make it harder for people to, yeah. um, uh, you know, uh, uh, leverage uh, fraudulent content yeah. to sell ads to uh, to re regular advertiser, but on on audiences that don't exist. Right. So, I think that's the real challenge. The the the, the real challenge is to is to explain, understand that we're talking about data protection and and that we have to protect people's data. Right. That, that anonymity, non-recognizable uh, option is not an option because advertising doesn't work on that basis. Yep. But it doesn't mean it has to be bad. It doesn't mean it has to be spooky or dangerous. Yep. It's, right. so it's finding that balance, striking that balance that I think is really important. Well, what's uh, fascinating here and you talk about that, because I, no, I, I think it's a really strong argument. Um, I was part of the Online Behavioral Advertising Council at the IAB about 10, 12 years ago. <laughs> and actually ran a study at the time, and I think, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was something like 75% of people didn't want to be tracked online. But 
85% of people wanted better advertising that was more relevant to them. And that disconnect has always amused me and puzzled me a bit. And I think it's, it comes down to essentially what you're saying at the end there, which is our uh, we don't do a good enough job of explaining to, to people the value of what they... It goes right back to the start of our conversation, actually. We don't do enough good enough job of explaining the value exchange that goes on. Um, and we, we don't do a good enough job of setting that bar of what is acceptable or not and making sure we all sit above it. Because if we're all doing yeah. good things and people understand why we're doing it, a lot of the challenges that we, we face, I think, go away. So. So we, need, we need a lot more, a lot more balance. Um, we need to ac acknowledge that there are a lot of bad practices that have been ruled out. They've been made impossible, right? And I think actually moving away from cookie will make a lot of those bad practices just technically impossible yep. because by using a, a permission identifier, a secure encrypted identifier like an 95 ID to identify customers, you can restrict who has access, who is able to decrypt. So there's a lot more security built in with solutions like ID5 rather than cookies. Uh, so we're going into we're going to something that works better, that is more secure, more protective of personal data. Yep. Uh, but at the same time, we have to accept that this is a this is a business model. It's a trade-off, right? And yes. and so explaining that to consumers, and again. For the five, six, seven, ten percent who are still unhappy with this trade-off, fine. We need to have payment options. They don't want to be marketed to. They don't want to be marketed. Let's accept that, right? Yep. And, and 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 give them other options to pay for the content and services that they still want to have access to. Yeah. I'm going to ask you get, to get your crystal ball out now. Okay. Um, uh, and um, looking back at all your experience over the years and your passion that, that was built in the early days with, with TV advertising and all the things you've learned about technology and consumers and, and, and uh, the industry. So wrapping all that together, um, give me some predictions. What's going to happen in the next kind of one, three, five years around privacy, data collaboration? Um, now where's the industry heading? And, and where do you think, if we're having this conversation a decade from now, when we'll both be in our mid forties, <laughs> um, yeah, what, right. what, what, what are we going to be talking about? Well, I'm an optimist, right? You have to be when you're when you're uh, when you're starting a company, I guess. Um, otherwise, you just you know shoot yourself. Um, so, so I think I think we'll be in a much better place. I think we'll be in a place where uh, you know some of the bad practices I've, I've mentioned that are very very related to the early days of of uh, basically doing advertising without you know considering users will be will not exist anymore. Uh, I think we'll be in a, in a, in a, in a meta place in terms of like, um, the balance of power between vault gardens and premium publishers, yep. right? Because right now there's a massive imbalance that is, that is, uh, that is putting a real risk on, on society as we know it and on the, you know, freedom of information on the things we talked about earlier. Yep. Um, so I think that we, we will, we will be in a play, better place from that standpoint. Um, hopefully we'll be in a place where, where we've moved away from, from third party cookies and we have, you know, better ways to identify customers that, that can uh, in, uh, in, integrate content and uh, consent, sorry, and, uh, and, and security at the heart. And so we have, yeah, we, we still have 10 years from now, we still have an, an ad supported business model that basically powers most of the internet. Um, but we have, you know, cleaned up a lot of the bad practices that have given it a bad name in some cases. And, uh, and uh, and we all live in a, a happy day ever after in this uh, in this, <laughs> this, this perfect new world. It sounds like a fabulous future, and and um, you know, with with well, you're an optimist. <laughs> well, with, with optimistic hat on, I, I I think it it's within our grasp. Everything is there that that would facilitate that happening. It's down to whether we are willing Absolutely. and and uh, and um, energetic enough in making it happen. I think it's just too important to fail. Yeah, no, I think so. I think we don't we don't have a choice. Success success is the only is the only option. Failure is not to quote Eminem. <laughs> Stand, exactly. Brilliant. Um, Matthew, it's been great speaking to you. I've got one last question I'll ask you in a moment, but um, really appreciate you you taking the time to speak to us today. Like I said at the start, it's very clear that you have a, a, a genuine passion and, and uh, desire for, for the industry that we're in, and that comes across. Um, so I thank you very much for being very open and honest with us and, and sharing some of your history and your thoughts and your, your vision for the future. Um, we ask everybody on these podcasts, um, uh, it's about people that have been pioneers and, and uh, kind of thought leaders in the identity space. So um, is there anybody in the industry that you admire that you would recommend that we um, go and speak to? 
Oh, a lot of people. Um, a lot of people. I, I have a, a, a newfound admiration since starting IDF, a newfound admiration for entrepreneurs. And and uh, and since we're we're in the UK, I think some of the most successful entrepreneurs in our space have been uh, the uh, the Media IQ founders, Lee and Gurman. Uh, so I don't know if you spoke to them already, but like I think they, their their experience in building what is one of the you know now a billion dollar company uh, with Media IQ, I think is fascinating. Yep. Um, and uh, and another one on the other end of the spectrum, uh, someone who's really starting, but really just starting, but also has a a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, and a, and a really noble mission as well. Is Amy Williams at Good Loop? Yep. Um, who is doing who's doing a great job around the notion of of of, uh, of uh, sustainability and and uh, uh, and environmental friendliness of advertising. So those would be my my two nominees on, yeah. on both ends of the spectrum. One very much starting, others you know pretty much resting I, on the laurels thing by now. I know, um, I know Leon Gurman uh, from from uh, pre MRQ days. We've never done a, a identity architects. Uh, with three people before, so maybe we could interview them together. That would be interesting. And Amy's great. I think she's recently moved to New York, hasn't she? So uh, to, to kind of push things uh, good loop forward there, which is great. So yeah, I think she's another you know, really great shout. So again, thank you for uh, taking the time today. It's been great speaking to you. Um, and to everyone listening, thank you for listening um, and look forward to bringing you another Identity Architects in the future. <laughs>